do. We have we are live on YouTube also. Uh, we have uh, made it live in Twitter and YouTube, so many are watching there. Respect, at least. I I hope that we are we are live on YouTube. We have made it live in Twitter and YouTube, so. Should we start now, or or do you want to wait more? You have a please unmute Sada. No, Professor Kamila, you can start now. It's eight o'clock. Okay. YouTube. Okay. Okay. Somebody's having their microphone mm -hmm. open. I think. But okay. Uh, so um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. It's morning here in Latin America, and good evening uh, for India. And uh, I would like to. Okay. Uh, I would like to thank the Global Forum on Diasporas and Transnationalists for this uh, session, for inviting the Center of Research on North America from our National Autonomous University of Mexico. And uh, of course, we have put this is uh, an opportunity for a continuous and long term exchange between the academics here in uh, Latin America and in Mexico. We are welcoming everybody to the session number 17 of the panel on migration and diasporas. Uh, as you see, we invited academics from Ecuador, the United States, Venezuela, Brazil, of course, India and Mexico. And of course, I thank all the speakers who accepted to join us today, the Ambassador Nahida Sorban, Anjali Sahai, Alma Maldonado, Maria Amelia Viteri, Elia Diaz and Luis Arnordo, Erika Sarmiento, uh, and of course to our faithful public who I understand that you are tired after already two hours of another event um, today. So uh, we will be happy to receive your feedback uh, in the chat box. We will try to respond to some of the questions accordingly. Your comments, of course, are very important, will be considered for a series of policy briefs that we will do with uh, the CISAN and the Global Forum on Diasporas and Transnationalism. And uh, I will uh, take great pleasure and honor to introduce our moderator today, uh, my friend and uh, co-author, Amba Pande. We've been collaborating for a couple of years now. She is a professor at the School of International Studies from the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. She did her PhD at the same institution. Her research focuses uh, on Indian diaspora and international migration, and she has published various articles in national inter international journals. She has also been a visiting, uh, visiting faculty at the University of Amsterdam, University of South Pacific, Otago University in New Zealand, National University of Singapore, and Australian National University. So Amba, you can please start the session now. Thank you. Thank you, Camelia. Can you hear me? Can you all hear yes. me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Camelia. Thank you for your welcome and for your introduction. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon everyone, because uh, we are really going global. Uh, so, uh, and I thank GRFDT and uh, CISAN for jointly organizing this very important session uh, on uh, student migration during post COVID-19, uh, Latin America and Asia, and having me as a moderator, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to moderate this discussion. To begin with, I will let me say some uh, few uh, things about as an introduction of this subject, you know. Uh, uh, so student migration is a widespread phenomenon across the world and with globalization and internationalization of education. Between the years 2000 and 2017, the number of international students increased for 2 million to 5.3 million. So it is an ever increasing number. And the trend is still rising till the time COVID struck. Uh, 
we have been discussing various aspects of migration in our webinars but student migration has some specific features which marks it different from other trends for the sending countries which is mostly generally the uh, developing countries uh, student migration is not only a source of brain drain but also a drain on capital drain on wealth if we take the case of india which is the second largest sending uh, country with numbers constantly increasing every year the uh, spending on tuition and hostel fee etc goes beyond 2.8 billion per year as far as the rbi reserve bank of india data says the second specific aspect of student migration is that both push and pull factors are equally important or perhaps pull factors are more important than the push factors there is no doubt that developing countries increasingly need high standard educational institutions for the growing number of their students but the data proves that the educational institutions in the developed countries are more in need of the funds to sustain their expensive educational system in the year 2018 uh, 19 only international students made a huge financial contribution of dollars 44.7 billion to the us economy so you can see the kind of money international students are pushing into the developed economies if we see india's case again the rising gross enrollment ratio in higher education has created a huge gap in demand and supply for higher educations uh, education especially uh, the in the institutions of repute which into which induce student migration however if we see the receiving institutions studies point out that contribution from international students is the most important source of revenue for them and they rely heavily on that that is the reason why every year we see there are so many many educational fairs to enroll in in uh, students uh, by you know most of the prominent universities of the world this is also the reason why we read reports about the um, fear of the closure of some of the australian universities in case uh, student migration is curtailed due to covid-19 so uh, uh, the uh, international students make a huge contribution in the receiving economies but from where is this fund coming from a recent data from migration policy institute show that 60% of the students in the in us rely on the personal or family sources and this personal and uh, family funding as far at least in case of india which i know of is mostly coming from public sector banks so the loans are taken from the public sector banks paid in the uh, institutions abroad for the education so here we really see that there is a drain of capital there is a real realization among the indian policy makers about this fact and one of the recent policy changes apart from many other changes included in the path breaking new education policy is that the government is going to invite top 200 uh, institution institutions to open campus in india in fact this is a hugely welcome step and might be a beginning towards attracting international students in india uh with this general uh, introduction we are going to start this extremely useful discussion today and enlighten ourselves with the case of various other countries and point of views the general framework that we are going to follow is that uh, each speaker will have 7 minutes and please please maintain this time and uh, the discussion will uh, revolve around four major points a very brief introduction of the country specific country which the speaker is dealing uh, the second point is the impact of pandemic vis-a-vis -vis the host country the third is government initiative to deal with the situation and the fourth point is suggestion for post pandemic po uh, uh, po policies so uh, we have six presentations today since uh, one is a joint presentation so we have seven scholars with us today 
five from Latin America and two from Asia, or rather two who, has, who are going to speak about Asia. I will uh, also invite some of the eminent scholars who will join us today in between the discussion. So uh, we will now begin, I really begin the uh, uh, discussion now. And uh, the first scholar which I'm going to invite is Professor Mario Emilio Viteri. Professor Viteri is a social scientist and a professor of cultural anthropology, qualitative uh, methods, gender, globalization, migration, and LGBT studies as well as linguistics. Uh, she has uh, examined uh, uh, several uh, roles uh, that race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexuality, and migrant status uh, play in the various aspects of uh, gender inequality, uh, displacement, environmental degradation, lack of access, etc. cetera. Uh, Professor Viteri holds a PhD in cultural anthropology from the American University in Washington, DC. So you can very well see that all these people, most of this uh, uh, scholars, I was going uh, the bio notes and I realized that all of them are uh, generally, uh, uh, themselves have migrated for, for higher studies to various countries. So it will be really interesting to see uh, uh, what they have to see in this regard. Uh, so please, Professor Vittari, can I invite you now? Please maintain the time for seven minutes. Thank you so much, Dr. Pandey. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you again to Camelia for your kind invitation and for this wonderful space. As you well mentioned, Dr. Pandey, I, I was an international student myself in the United States, in Washington, D.C., and I cannot imagine my experience without having the cultural resources, the campus itself, the uh, very diverse set of international and also local students that became my family during my PhD. And all that was easily enabled by being physically right, present on campus and taking advantage of all the resources. And all those options have uh, basically changed through the COVID-19 um, pandemic. There, There's a lot to talk about. I, I have chosen to focus in um, three specific things in order to be mindful about time. So as an anthropologist and a former international student in the United States, I'm concerned about how the pandemic will widen achievement gaps and will also widen, are already widening education gap in terms of exclusion. And as we know, marginalized communities and racialized communities are those that are already suffering from those negative effects. Thinking about economic mobility, social mobility, cultural mobility. Going back to my country, Ecuador, in coastal cities like Guayaquil, and I think that is similar to some parts in India, students and their parents from marginalized communities that do not have access to computer, iPads, smartphones and or Wi-Fi need to do homework following instructions on the television. Uruguay, for example, has been able to address this gap by securing a computer and Wi-Fi for almost every key, according to the Inter-American Bank's education blog. If we also look, continue looking at these gaps and how they have expanded, Regrettably, regrettably, with the pandemic, they were always there, but now they are more visible and now they are more strengthened in a negative way, is that according to the Economic Policy Institute, as many as 35% of students in low income and rural communities don't have internet access in the United States. Now, when this is measured by race and ethnicity, the gap is greater for African-American and Hispanic Latino families. As you might imagine, this percentage is three times, four times higher if we look at countries like Ecuador. What does that mean? Few universities in countries like the United States will currently sponsor students to travel internationally. So the impacts in terms of economic losses for those universities, the students, the families, as well as experiential learning is very high. In the case of private universities in Ecuador who have fostered exchange programs abroad continuously, they might not be able to guarantee students' safety 
For example, if a student is to get sick in a, in a destination country, this will require additional health resources and otherwise. These within the context that visa programs uh, have been sus suspended, consulates are closed, um, presidents like uh, Donald Trump declare in April that international students' presence was hurting the economy and many other political issues that, again, act together to expand the gap. In terms of policy options, the education gap, in terms of policy options, the way we have traditionally understood international education needs to be rethinked. And also, as we rethink how and what does it mean to do virtual education, how do we adapt um, curriculum, subjects, pedagogies of learning and teaching to the current context. This will imply strengthening virtual communities of learning, supporting online research, improving online certificates, but these all require additional resources. Many governments, many universities, uh, many schools will not be in the capacity to fulfill. We are still learning on how to adapt new technologies to create excellent quality through virtual teaching and learning. In the case of my university, is a private liberal arts university. University in Ecuador is the highest rank in the country. We have um, the opportunity, because the university has the resources, of having been trained from week one uh, when the pandemic was declared in better ways to um, do virtual teaching and all the technologies in place for professors. And again, this is not the case for the majority of the country. In terms of post-pandemic scenarios, I believe that one of the key words, which is flexibility, will continue to be the central word, as well as adapting to what the context allows. For example, partial reopening of laboratories like uh, medical, and or engineering and or math laboratories. In the case of School of Arts, partial reopening of studios, what does that imply for both students as well as the administration in the universities, as well as families, considering that there are many, there have been letters written and even um, specific claims made by parents, families and the students in countries like the United States to ask for a reduction of the registration and the tuition provided that students are not using the campus facilities. And we have seen universities in the United States having to lower down their registration costs. So we will see, we will continue to see a change and a negotiation between also the extremely high costs of education especially private education, and how uh, families, parents, students negotiate and navigate those um, high costs. As I um, close yeah, the, you, you this intervention, yeah. the mechanism we're currently learning from the pandemic will have a lasting effect in how we craft curriculums. Campus might just never look the same. COVID-19 has also provided us with this opportunity to revisit what was working and what was not working in general education and a chance to post revisit adjust change. The world has forever changed and with it, the pedagogies and subjectivities involved in learning and teaching. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you very much. And you really raised some of the very pertinent points here about the uh, rising gap due to the excess of technology and uh, whether, you know, these online, uh, this uh, whole process of online courses, you know, and whether it, they are going to reduce the registration fee, etc. But uh, I really think that there is also a question of whether the students will actually are actually ready to take uh, these online courses fully you know even those who are uh, capable of uh, you know accessing the technology you know that is also a point uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, uh,
this talk. Now, let me invite uh, Professor uh, uh, Ambassador Nahida Shobhan uh, from Bangladesh. Ambassador Shobhan is a Bangladeshi diplomat who is the first uh, female diplomat in Middle East. She served as Jordanian ambassador from January uh, uh, 1st, 2020. Earlier, she served as a director general of UN Department of uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, let me add to this that Ambassador Chauvin is a very academically oriented diplomat, and it is always a pleasure to listen to her. So I invite Ambassador Chauvin, please. Chauvin, Ambassador Chauvin. Yes, um, good yeah. afternoon, good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Ambe. Uh, good yeah. afternoon from Jordan. Um, uh, you have humbled me a little bit. I'm not <laughs> that uh, academically oriented person. I, I'm still uh, trying to learn. Uh, uh -huh. So my advantage in uh, this kind of platform is to learn from you and all the other speakers, uh, like uh, big professors. So I feel a bit uh, humbled to be here. But thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, a big thanks to uh, JRFDT and uh, CISAN. Uh, for uh, inviting me to be a panelist here and on top of everything for organizing this session and very much dedicated to the international students. Because in our uh, discussions on migration issues and on migrants, uh, this is a big um, chunk of population that we always uh, tend to avoid and sometimes forget. So I think this is a very good start at least to start talking about it. And even during all the negotiations that we had previously, where I, I had the opportunity to engage, like the negotiations on um, inclusion of migration in 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, or in GFMD, or in uh, Global Compact on Migration, we never had the opportunity to include the international students. And this is a big gap. Why big gap? Um, I'll come to that later. But uh, let, let me uh, just give you an idea. I, I have four areas to look into. First, uh, since I'm coming from Bangladesh and Bangladesh has um, sends out a huge number of international students abroad from Bangladesh. Um, uh, so I'll focus a little bit on the Bangladesh scenario, then the global scenario and some of the main challenges. And lastly, what can be done? So um, to talk about Bangladesh, as I was saying that uh, in general, we have a huge um, number of population, 170 million people in Bangladesh. Uh, and um, as per the UNESCO's uh, statistics in 2017, there were more than 60,000 people going, students going abroad for tertiary education. And uh, most of them, mm, uh, well, our, the, the students from Bangladesh used to be mostly going to like USA, Canada, and UK. But very recently, Malaysia has become the highest destination having around uh, 23,000 uh, students receiving from Bangladesh uh, in Malaysia uh, from uh, 2018. Uh, but apart from that, uh, USA, Australia, UK and Canada are top uh, four, um, apart from Malaysia, are the top four um, destination of the students from Bangladesh. And USA, Bangladesh, uh, Bangladeshi students are among the top 10 um, countries of origin in the USA. Most of the topics that they uh, go abroad for studying are like medicine, um, medical sciences, IT, and business. Um, the reasons, uh, it is mostly, uh, I would say, uh, the capacity in the financial terms or capacity in the economic terms. Uh, most of these students are uh, self-financed, but not much of debt story here. Uh, and um, a big chunk also among these um, 60,000 plus uh, students uh, get also scholarships from abroad, from the countries of destination as well. Uh, a huge number of people in last two years, last two, three years are coming up from the middle class of Bangladesh. And you can see the middle class is enlarging. And according to UN statistics, by 2025, it will uh, increase three times and uh, coming up something like about 35, million, 35 million people in Bangladesh in the, in the context of middle class. And these are the majority of people that are coming out from Bangladesh to study abroad. Um, 
for uh, what uh, the, the government has been doing during the COVID, there has not been any financial support to any of the international students. It is mostly self-financed and self-choice. Uh, but in terms of repatriation, government has been engaging to repatriate international students from abroad to Bangladesh when their uh, university is closed. Now, let's take a little bit of a um, uh, global scenario. According to UNESCO, also in 2017, uh, the UNESCO statistics shows that there were uh, 5.3 million people uh, known as uh, international students around the world. And um, half of, uh, almost half of these uh, students went to USA, UK, and thirdly to China. And countries of origins are firstly from China, then Russia, India, and also from Austria. Um, I would say that um, whether uh, we, we need to look at it in a different way, maybe sometimes. I always try to look at things like half glass flu full or half glass empty. And in, in terms of in, in, uh, international students, uh, my story would be half plus full, I would say. Uh, because we need to look at it, whether it is about uh, having the challenge of uh, financing or whether to term that financing as investment, because education is a good investment. And uh, for many of the countries of origins, if it is from the developing uh, states, I would say it would give students, uh, international students, uh, a lot of opportunity to have a very good global exposure. And also um, it can close down a big knowledge gap uh, that we see between the country, developing countries and the developed countries. And secondly, also a very good um, opportunity for um, an exposure of the international environment and international education environment. So it's, it's making the international students a part of global citizenship. And that's the uh, half, half glass uh, full from my part. Now, uh, it doesn't go without any challenges. Uh, let, let us uh, talk about a little bit on the, let me talk about a little bit on the challenges. I don't know if I have much time. I, I, how many minutes? Two more, two more minutes, please. Okay, I'll finish in two more yeah. minutes. So one, so I'll, I'll pick uh, three major challenges. One is the registration or application processes. Uh, in some of the countries, it is quite uh, hassle, uh, hassling. And in that way, I think the students that really deserves to go abroad to study and then come back uh, misses the opportunities. And those who are not like a valuable asset uh, may slip down because of the application processes and registration processes. One big issue that needs to be taken into account is the situation of the mental health. Because a lot of the students, when they go abroad, a lot of them might have financial issue. As you have already mentioned, Dr. Amba, I was listening to you about the debt situation. But even if they are not in a debt situation, they still have this you know, pressure of financing and the stress of studying and also the stress of being in a completely new environment. Uh, so uh, mental health is something of the international students that needs to be looked into. And now let me uh, take a look at what has happened done, uh, what has happened through because of the COVID-19. A huge situation of uncertainty, whether the courses are going to be you know, continued, whether the students will uh, be able to continue with their dorms or the housing, whether they will be able to come back and if they come back to the country of origin, whether they will be able to go back and um, uh, you know, continue their studies. So these are the another areas. And I think that, um, and another point sometimes in some countries, not all countries, but in many countries, a lot of international students are also um, a victim of stigma. So that is something uh, that needs to be looked into. Um, now, uh, what can be done? Um, I would say that um, a lot of uh, proper training and also in, 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 uh, in change in policy making. Please Can I take 30 please. seconds? Yeah. Uh, policy changes in the countries of destination and countries of origin 
is very much required to help these students and also to help this mobility. Uh, mental health should be taken care of by the institutions as well as by the host community. And also lastly, I think that a new mechanism that we should be uh, looking into that needs to uh, take into account the crisis situation and also include the international students and their challenges in order to make both the countries of origin and the countries of destination uh, to gain from brain gain, not brain gain. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Shobhan. This is really interesting. And thank you for seeing the half glass full and uh, seeing that we are creating the human capital. You know, that's a big thing. But, uh, mm, uh, you know, the problem arises when there is a distress migration of students, you know, since we are not able to provide uh, the suitable uh, educational standards to them. So uh, thank you very much uh, for this. So. Uh, our next speaker I would like to invite is uh, Professor Alma Melando. Uh, she uh, received her PhD from uh, in higher education from Boston College, uh, and uh, her supervisor, it seems, was Philip G. Uh, Elt Betak, who is uh, a very very uh, prominent. Uh, a scholar in this field. She served as assistant professor in the Center for Study of Higher Education at the University of Arizona, USA till 20, uh, 2009. And since 2010, she is the researcher at the Department of Educational uh, Research for the Center of Research and Advanced Studies in Mexico. She is also uh, an author uh, of numerous articles and books on higher education in Mexico and in other countries. Uh, she is also the editor of an uh, education blog called Distancia por Timo Timpos. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would like to invite Dr. Alma Masendo, please. Maldendo, please. Thank you very sorry. much, Dr. Ramba. I, yeah. I really I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing the names correctly. Well, uh, this yeah. happens also uh, to yeah. us regarding your last name, so I think we are yes. even yes. here. Yeah. But thank you very much for the kind invitation and, and for this introduction. Thank you very much to Camelia uh, for uh, inviting me to this panel. I truly appreciate this opportunity to talk uh, uh, in this panel about this very important topic between Asian and Latin American colleagues. And also I appreciate that most of us are women. Um, and that's, that's also a nice, a nice discussion. And I would like to talk about three main issues um, and taking the opportunity to, to put some ideas here regarding migration and the, and the current situation of the pandemic. First of all, let me say that um, universities in general, as we know, they are very ancient and they have a long history, but universities have survived at least nine major pandemics um, along um, their history. So this is only one more. Um, it's not the, the, the pandemic, the most lethal pandemic actually that we have survived and we hope we will find a solution regarding this pandemic. But universities has a long, uh, have a long history. And I think this is one of these crises where we need to redefine and rethink about um, our major issues. I agree with uh, Maria Amelia about what, what this represents in terms of facing new challenges for universities. And I will uh, like to start with one example um, um, here. First of all, universities are international. This is another characteristic that we know about universities since uh, their creation. By definition, they are international. Um, so, but there, there are several discussions that at least uh, in my case, I tried to avoid for a long period of time regarding internationalization and universities. And one has to do with what is an international student. And for a long time, 
I, I, I didn't want to really address the debate on to what extent an international student can be an online student. And I think this is the moment where we have to redefine this and we need to discuss again. Because um, in, my, in my opinion and given my training, I also studied in the US and I was a professor in the US and, and so on. Uh, international student, one main component has to do with um, moving geographically to another country and have the experience and live the experience. And, and obviously the European Union came to redefine what was an international student because they also define it by domestic, non-domestic. I mean, there were all these different terms to define international student. But in terms of online students, that was more difficult always because we were saying, well, it is not exactly an international student if they don't have the experience. But now that we all suddenly, we all became online professors, online students, I think it's a good moment to reconsider this definition and to rethink what is the way we are um, um, defining this. Uh, and this is just one example. The other, of course, has to do with migration. I mean, this pandemic has um, 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 implied different challenges regarding migration. And I will use two quick examples um, in terms of, of the time. One is the recent debate in the US regarding uh, uh, the migration and regarding this um, issue on if you are not taking classes at the campus, you won't be considered an international student or you, you, or you will lose your uh, rights as an international student and you have to be deported. This is one thing and, and obviously uh, the issue uh, was solved uh, fortunately in the US in terms of uh, allowing them to take online classes. But I will put you the other example in the case of Mexico. Here we are discussing that if you are not in the country, you are not allowed to receive the national scholarships as an international student because you have to be in the country. And this is, an, again, the, the other side of the debate, but it has a lot of implications in terms of migration and the meaning of a, and the rights of international students. Um, another issue that we need to discuss is what is going to be happening with the most vulnerable students in this context. And obviously, Maria Amelia uh, mentioned it, several situations in Latin America that we are facing here in terms of uh, inequities, the gaps uh, in terms of access to technology. I mean, these are issues that developing countries are facing, and we all are facing this situation. The sub minister of higher education in Mexico the other day said that it is ex expected to, to lose at least 8% of the total enrollment of higher education because the pandemic situation. Um, this is probably very optimistic to think about only 8% um, will drop. Uh, but this represents at least three, more than 3,100 students in the case of Mexico that we might miss. So in this context, where is the situation of uh, internationalization and higher education? Well, one of the issues that now we have to discuss uh, in our countries is how relevant is going to uh, be internationalization because uh, in, in a context with all these necessities, with all these problems, obviously the main one being um, health, the health issue, um, internationalization won't be a priority. That's, that's the real situation in a country like Mexico. So the, the big challenge is how can, can we continue putting the topic in the agenda? How can we continue saying, it's still important, 
Um, no matter what is the way we Please are doing. Can include? Please can yes. yes, yes, I am finishing. Um, so how to put this issue, how to become, uh, and how to redefine the way we are saying, still we need to put this in the agenda of the institutions, in the governments, and uh, I think I think these issues, uh, together with other like access, inequity, quality, um, is going to be there. So um, I, I will leave the the discussion here, but uh, I hope we can we will have time to continue debating. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor Maldonado. This was a very interesting uh, presentation in the sense that you just gave the whole picture of uh, uh, Mexico. And uh, this was really uh, interesting. And you know, all of us uh, turning into online teachers and students turning into online students. So where is this whole challenge of uh, you know the opportunity for exposure, which international uh, education brings uh, is, is uh, have to be seen and how this uh, how the developing countries are going to actually uh, 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 address this issue is also to be seen thank you very much uh, for this and uh, as i had uh, said earlier that we have some very eminent scholars from all over the world with us now so uh, i would like to invite uh, uh, from the uh, Rio de Janeiro Federal University, uh, Juliana Fogul, uh, Professor Juliana Fogul, uh, uh, can you please uh, come and uh, say your opinion, give your opinion in very briefly uh, about this whole situation? Professor Juliana, are you there? Uh, I think she is, uh, we cannot hear you. Please unmute yourself. Uh, I think you may hear me now. Yes, thank you. Thank you for uh, being here. And uh, we would love to hear something from you on this issue. Yes, we are dealing like with different difficult topics here in Brazil because uh, mainly if you see the things that um, Brazilian students and Indian students and all of these foreign students of international programs bring to the country they go, this is not being talked about. And we are having a discussion about whether the foreign students must or not go to the to the to the countries but i think this this is this is a thing that it's very bad because we are seeing that the migration is progressive progressively going into the defense security programs and even with trump with all of the barriers they put in the the foreign to come in and the mexicans and the indians and we are we are um, we are having like so many problems with that and losing so much because science is made with integration, with internationalization, and the COVID-19 programs are showing this to us that we cannot work in one country or close in one country because the frontiers, they do not exist like we used to know um, from a, a, a time above. So we have like cultural frontiers, new cultural frontiers from these groups that goes from India to US. We have um, economic frontiers, international and, and, and financial frontiers. So this is a very strange topic. And I think this discussion is, is a very good discussion. And we have to achieve a lot of progress because when you stop the international migrations of students, we are stopping the, the learnings and all of the things that these students brings to their countries that they provide and the countries that they go to. And here in Brazil, we have a, a federal program that are losing so many students now that call Ciências in Fronteras that the government puts to, um, to internationalize our science and our students 
learning that we need to go abroad. We need to go to other places. So I think I would like to propose or ask for the people, how do they see that this progressive, um, how do they see, uh, how are we are going to lose um, in, in terms of going forward in our academic discussions and academic achievements with this um, limitations from Ma students to go in abroad? Ma I'll just conclude it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, very, you much. very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I also uh, uh, would like to suggest that please write your questions in the chat box so that in the end we can take it up if in case we have time. So uh, I also want to invite uh, Professor Jao Carlos Clevenzera. Uh, she's also from Brazil. And uh, I invite you uh, to say, uh, give your opinion on the subject, please. Can you hear? Uh, Hello. Yes. Hello, Professor. Please go ahead with your view. Are you talking about Luis Ordones? I didn't understand. Can you? Okay. Can you speak in English? Yeah. Or, or Professor Kamala can translate. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, uh, maybe uh, he cannot. Uh, okay, maybe we can give the 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 floor to somebody else. Meanwhile, okay, okay. okay. He cannot okay. put okay. on his microphone, but okay. maybe later. I okay. suggest. Okay. okay. So I would also like to invite Professor Bhatt who has been a constant support to us and uh, he has he uh, is uh, he has, he was kind enough to grace this uh, 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 session uh, professor bhat can i invite you please to give your views sir mute sir to keep on mute please unmute yourself yeah, professor yeah, bhat I'm, yeah I'm, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you professor amber for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity and inviting me to have a, a brief comment on the, the presentations. I think they're very brilliant presentations, right from uh, yes. the uh, yes. first uh, presentation, which emphasized on cultural resources. You know, uh, the students migrate because they are being pulled into the stream, wherever the destination is. Like I, I would say US is the main destination for many of the Indians. And I'm speaking from Andhra Pradesh or now Telangana. And it's one of the areas, you know, hinterlands from where huge number of students every year migrate to the US. Now this migration is facilitated by a huge diaspora which exists there. And secondly, there's a Hello. linkage which connects uh, the students there. So it's a process wherein migration okay. of the students is not just student migrating, but it's a migration for a longer time. Any, yeah, every yeah. student who goes yeah, to yeah. the US, for instance, yeah. would not think of coming back until Absolutely. they prove themselves they cannot yes. make it. So it's a stepping stone for the future life. And so student migration is only a initial uh, uh, step to go ahead. Yes. And uh, therefore it's the it's same for all the developing countries. Most of the developed countries, all their cream of their population, you know, student population gets yes. absorbed in these countries. And perhaps you find a new kind of empire building, yes. uh, you know, like we uh, had uh, earlier the colonial empire building. And today it is a new colonialism uh, under which uh, the elites, the, the intelligentsia of all the countries from developing countries in particular, yes. uh, assembles in certain uh, locations. And that is uh, one of the important uh, points which need to be looked into. And the, uh, yeah, I think- Please let, conclude, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, I, yes, I think yes. you're going to go yeah. ahead. I'm also just yeah. only emphasizing on international experience. The COVID has given some kind of a, uh, a problem for international exposure. So yeah. 
the international migration of the students and the experience will not be the same as it would be unless yes. we reopen, which yes. is happening now. I heard the uh, US uh, yes. colleges yes. are yes. opening and yes. already yes. students yes. have started moving yes. for their yes. academic courses yes. now. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Amba. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. And I would also like to invite uh, quickly Professor Raj, Professor Raj Bardulu. Can you also please give your opinion? Is Professor Raj there? Okay, so in case we, we I, I will, in case Professor Raj is not there, so uh, can I invite again Professor Jao from Brazil? Are you there, sir? Hello, can you hear me? Okay, okay. Yes. Okay. You can hear me oh, now? Both of them are there, yes. please. Uh, uh, wait, Raj, Familia. Raj, yeah, Professor Raj, please continue, then we will again yeah. invite, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Um, I would say that the discussion is interesting. Two points I want to make is one, that while the exposure to international universities is, is important uh, in person, not online, this only takes care of few people who are able to afford to go to the US or to Canada or England or wherever they go to. So this does not actually uh, give the opportunity to, to most people who would like to be in similar situations. So this is, again, building classes, elitism. And some of them have the intention of, including myself, I went to the UK to study and never came back to my country in Dominica to, to work for that matter. So, so, so there's this intention built into when you go abroad that you will stay there because your skills are not going to be used. That's one point that how do we expand access and experience of other countries who are not, uh, sorry, other students who are not able to pay for their education. And here I have a suggestion. As you know, the campuses are being uh, annexed. The um, US campuses are being set up in certain countries. For example, in the Middle East, you've got the Cornell University, you have the uh, Hopkins University campus, and it gives chance to local as well as other international students in the region. So what I'm proposing is that in this situation now, in terms of internationalizing education for lots of people or giving that kind of experience uh, is one way is to see how sister institutions could be set up. Now in Dominica, we had this uh, medical school which was um, uh, some university in the US. They set up the medical schools in a couple of uh, islands, Grenada, Dominica, a couple of other places. And their reason was different, twofold, to make education cheaper and accessible to more students who cannot get into medical schools in the US. And then they spend one year or two years of the last of their studies Please back conclude, in the- Professor Raj. In, yeah, I'm going to conclude yes. by saying, to give more opportunities to be people and more students for international education. Perhaps this idea of having sister institutions or having some kind of arrangement between yes. the UK or whatever, that's one. Two is to see also to, to revisit actually, what is, what is international education? If people are not coming back, if these graduates are not coming back to serve their country, is this more for personal gains or social gains? So I leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your inputs, Professor Raj. This was really very enriching. And yes, I mean, the way you said about, you know, these uh, opening sister institutions, campuses, you know, this is really a welcome step. I, I too, uh, I, you know, agree with you fully. Uh, so now uh, I will invite Professor uh, Carlos uh, Calavara, Calazarawa uh, from Brazil. Uh, hello. Yeah, hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, being here in this morning. I, I am a student of Brazil. I'm working on LABIMI, Laboratory of uh, Study Immigration of the World in Rio de Janeiro. And I ask it to the teacher Erica Sarmiento uh, about the last uh, court of um, in education um, to the government. 
Okay. Understand, teacher? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your in inputs. You know, uh, this was, uh, it, it was just a random invitation. And I'm really grateful that, you know, we could hear uh, some more views on this. So uh, now to move on, I would uh, like to invite now Professor Ru Luis Arnold, uh, Arnaldo. Uh, Professor Arnaldo, he is a PhD in biochemistry from MIT. Uh, and completed the advanced management program uh, uh, at uh, Venezuela. He, uh, he was a professor at medical school of the University of Venezuela and presided various academic associations. He also uh, is an executive secretary of the Permanent Commission for Science and Techlo Technology of the House of Representatives at, at the National Congress of uh, Venezuela. So uh, we really have uh, the pleasure of having him. And uh, this paper is a joint paper. So along with Professor Arnaldo, we have Dr. Uh, Elit Diaz. She is a PhD in business administration from University uh, of Venezuela, a master's in social psychology from the University of Barcelona, Spain. She worked as an associate professor at the University of uh, Venezuela for 10 years. And since then, she has been cooperating with the uh, Inter uh, Foundation, Inter uh, Connected, Connected the DOS Foundation for Venezuela. She also uh, conducted research in this uh, field in the, with the group of Latin American Collaborative Research. So I invite you both to present your paper, please. You have seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know, I am waiting to have the picture shown. Is that OK? So your voice is not clear, please. Perhaps you can turn um, your your video off. It can maybe we can. Oh, I it. should talk the video. Okay, I, I will take it off then. No. Okay. Okay, it's better. Now. Can you show my uh, the video now? No, I I can show my video. Okay, I I will speak. But I understand the video is not showing now. Is that correct? Uh, I, or or uh, you are going to show my video? You are going to show the I, video. No, no. What I'm saying, Luis, is that uh, if we cannot hear you, maybe it's better to turn your video off so that we can hear you better. OK, but can you hear me now? Yes. OK, so I can go on and just speak like everybody else. Or you would rather show my video. If you show my video, I will have one more minute to comment at the end because the video lasts only six minutes. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. We can hear you. OK, okay I will go ahead. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk uh, to you. Thank you to the Global Research Forum on Diaspora and Transnationalism and the Center for Research on North America of the Universidad Nacional uh, Autónoma de México. Uh, we would like to talk now, myself and Dr. Elliot Diaz from Fundación Interconectados Venezuela, about uh, a concept which is the flipped forum, flipped forum, like flipped classroom, and social capital development in the context of a student migration due to COVID-19. COVID what do we mean by flipped forum and social capital development? From our studies on Venezuelan diaspora, and everybody knows that in Venezuela now we have a big political problem, so we have to move between politics and policies uh, in order to understand the Venezuelan diaspora and the students that might be studying abroad or the, which uh, students which their families went abroad within this diaspora and are studying abroad. How do we do to cover for that uh, 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 capital drain, for that brain drain that we are having of people leaving the country, and much more with this uh, COVID-19 problem. We have been studying 
uh, the possibility of developing social capital instead using the technologies, using information and communication technologies to build social capital. And in, in this time of diaspora, uh, we understand that with COVID-19, more than ever, peer-to-peer -peer electronic communities must be developed more in these times. And uh, they are very clearly related to student migration. Peer-to-peer -peer communication uh, directly will uh, allow to exchange information, distribute tasks, or execute transactions. So we have, some people even think that the technologies, technologies are a panacea. But what? What is the problem in and in the world? It's trust. How do we trust each other? When you use technologies, it's even harder to develop trust. We all know from the sociology uh, that uh, primary groups develop trust through life, family, country, and so on. Uh, when these students go abroad, it's very easy for them to, buy, uh, to generate bonds, what is called bonding social capital with their uh, uh, relatives with people from the same country. But how we do for them that remain in the country? How we develop bridging social capital, which is, according to Putnam, the value assigned to social networks between socially heterogeneous groups. We must develop bridging social capital with the students that are abroad, people that are in the country, much more if they are researchers, if they are in science doing research, we are interested in having all that knowledge available for the people that are in the country. And with the COVID-19 and the uh, lack of possibility of get together, of moving freely about the countries, much more our uh, development. Forums is uh, in the chat my email and I put it uh, 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 a reference is in Spanish the paper but you can translate it into the use of uh, the, the technologies as a motivational element to work in, in, in science. Let me explain very quickly what a flipped forum is. Imagine that today's forum that we are having, this very important and interesting forum between the Americas, Asia, and Europe people, and Europe people all over the world, we have done it in the following way. Before the forum, before today, 15 days ago, all of us put up in the web our talks, six, seven minutes talks, put it 15 days before. We have 15 days time to see those talks, to the, see the presentations, make notes, uh, uh, ask the the opponent, the the, uh, the professors who gave the talks, what uh, to clarify points, make uh, uh, forward ideas, and then use this time rather than watching each other for seven minutes. Times uh, uh, is over forty minutes that we will be watching each other, going directly to to discuss things that could come up from the previous watching of the presentations. What we have been doing for eight years now with the Flipped Forum in our country is to have uh, in a national meeting, the Venezuelan Association for the Advancements of Science, we have these flip forums where people abroad, people in the country present their talks previously on the web. And the day of the meeting, we come to join together to build trust precisely. With the students abroad, we think that the bonding of social capital is already developed. They probably they are in uh, in contact with people from their same countries. But we ha they have to build bridging social capital. They have to start meeting people in their own field of research in other countries, in their origin country, and in their recipient country. If I am doing a PhD in biochemistry in neurochemistry, I want to know who is doing neurochemistry in my country in other words in other in other parts of the world we can use the flipped forum for them to put up their presentations have interactions and trust 
and therefore building that social capital that is needed in our countries. In a sense, that's what we are doing today. Okay, but let's face it, today we have a two minutes, uh, uh, I would take one more minute. Today, we have to understand each other, something that is very hard because uh, we speak English, uh, you know, more or less rusty English, and we have to uh, understand what we are trying to say and to interact in order to do for further work. That's why I put my Gmail, I, I put a, you a, a, a print, uh, you know, a link to a print, and I put a, a link to our uh, blog, which you can read in English, which uh, to cover for that. Uh, in fact, the presentation I have uh, prepared for you, I have it in, in Hindi, the, uh, the page for the people here from India to understand. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope we develop a lot of social capital with this kind of activity. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. And this was really interesting to see, you know, how uh, uh, actually the social capital that you talk about is the real strength of uh, human capital, you know, it is where that human capital can be used to, to its best, you know. So if we can really develop this, this will be very interesting. Thank you very much. So uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Anjali Sahai who is an associate professor, Department of Political, uh, Legal and International Studies, Gannon University. Dr. Sahai has a, she is a multifaceted personality apart from being a program director of various, uh, 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 pro, uh, I mean, uh, programs in her university. She is also the uh, resident faculty of uh, CNET uh, for teachers, at, at seems, it seems. Uh, Dr. Sahai uh, also successfully runs the Model UN program at Gannon, uh, East Carolina, and all Domin Dominion universities. For uh, she has been doing this for almost two decades. Her area of research is uh, on international migration, international relations. Her book, titled "Indian Diaspora in the United States: Brain Drain or Brain Gain," um, has received much appreciation in the academic world. Uh, and apart from being an educator, Dr. Saha is also a leader, author, researcher, and a performing artist of Indian classical dance. That's very interesting. And uh, she is trained in Kathak, and we really hope to see her performance sometime. I welcome Dr. Saha. Please go ahead with your seven minutes. Can you hear us, Professor Saha? Sorry. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Pandey, for your um, kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to try to do this in seven minutes, but it will be hard. Um, so I um, would like to start with a very brief introduction part that I always like to add. So um, I, I do, um, I'm also an international student that came to the United States 21 years ago. So uh, this topic is very uh, dear to my heart because of our own educational experiences that we faced in the United States. Um, one of my broad conclusions, and I'm starting with conclusions so that I can flow from that. These are the overall conclusions that I have. Um, there are two main impacts on migration currently. These are both political and health. And if we look at these as independent variables, both of these are impacting student migration. And overall, I'd like to believe that the political weighs in much higher than the health will in the long term, because as an optimist, I believe that this uh, pandemic will eventually lessen and die away. Um, but it's a political factors that have always impacted student migration into the United States. This is also not the first time that an external event has directly impacted student immigration into the United States. One of the biggest um, events was 9-11, and we saw post 9-11 um, how student migration um, was heavily impacted in the United States. So I'm not going to go over the statistics for Indian immigration into the United States for for international students because uh, various presenters as well as Dr. Pandey, you already mentioned in your introduction to this uh, webinar today. But just to reiterate that Indians 
are the second highest international student cohort in the United States after China, um, followed by South Korea, Saudi Arabia, and Canada. So these are the top five um, countries of origin for international students. And I will focus on Indian um, immigration, student immigration, because I was told to focus on the Indian immigration uh, per se. So in terms of field of study, um, as can be um, probably guessed, most Indian students opt to study in the STEM fields, engineering, business management, math, and computer science are the top three fields of study for international students uh, from India. And also they tend to be almost entirely in the graduate uh, programs as compared to the undergraduate programs in the United States. So uh, moving on to um, the impact of the pandemic versus the host country, um, I'd like to take a completely political view on this and start with saying that while the world was uh, grappling with the impact of COVID-19 pandemic and how this would impact the immigration, it's very important to note that even prior to the pandemic even began, uh, in terms of um, the current U.S. administration, already cut off, um, largely cut off immigration to the United States as part um, of its overall immigration policy, and this just continued during the pandemic. Um, we have various examples, such as um, the processing of um, new visas uh, for H-1Bs and the new uh, student visas, all of this went down dramatically. Um, when the pandemic actually started, the USCIS, uh, which is charged with the processing for immigration applications, uh, they had already closed. They were not processing any other new applications. So there are various political executive orders that came out that directly impact uh, the student migration. And if we look at um, particularly the year 2016 and 2017, we note that um, the growth fell sharply in 2017 and 2018 academic years. Prior to these years, the Indian student immigration had actually doubled in numbers. And that was a notable uh, increase in the size of uh, student immigration into the United States. But after 2016 and 17, if we look at those years, then this numbers dropped down dramatically. And to highlight how important this is, um, if you look at the Indian enrolled, Indians enrolled in graduate level computer science and engineering programs, um, they declined sharply by almost 67% um, in the US universities. And that's, that's pretty good. Uh, number to take into account. So um, prior to the pandemic, I just want to mention one related aspect that's pretty important for the student's decision to migrate. Eventually, the migrant, the student migrant who, who comes to the United States, the end result of that is that they expect um, three years of optional practical training. And after that, they expect to get jobs in the United States. So when there were announcements that no new H-1Bs uh, would be um, processed in the United States, that had a trickle-down effect on new student applications as well. So I'm almost at six minutes. So I'm going to go straight to the um, COVID, um, COVID hurdles. Um, clearly, the, some of the biggest hurdles has been the ban on international flights. Um, so students cannot come into the country. But when uh, it was announced, um, as we've already talked about it, that if uh, you cannot be in a complete face-to-face -face, um, um, uh, classrooms, then you cannot be considered international students. This would already have a direct impact on students who would want to come to the United States. Um, so I have uh, three or four clear uh, impacts that I would like to mention. Uh, as part of my conclusion. Um, so with the pandemic, we see for Indian student immigrants that there will be a definite dip in the demand for U.S. student visas for this year, uh, for both China and India specifically. Um, second, universities will face a fall in revenue, especially if a large number of Indian students stay away. 
because they are uh, enrolled in the graduate STEM programs. And um, in an article that I have published previously, a lot of universities are looking to open remote campuses in uh, various Asian countries. So we're just going to see more of that. Um, more restrictive immigration policies in the United States will um, lead to a shift in the flow of international students to Canada, which has seen as much as a 127% increase in the last four years of Indian students moving out of uh, the United States and moving into Canada because of their um, you know, more open door policy. And uh, this, um, this is uh, the last thing that we have all talked about is that um, with the global uh, talent war um, that every country is trying to retain the best and the brightest, especially in the STEM fields, uh, what we are now seeing is a self-inflicted American brain drain since the election of President Trump in the last four years. So um, my overall recommendation, I'm out of time, is that um, leaders of both countries um, have not looked at um, migration. We have seen President Trump's visit to India in February and, Pre and Prime Minister Modi's visit to United States last year. It, it was a very warm, engaging partnership between the two leaders, but we are not seeing that uh, warmth flow into the migration side of things and how that can be eased up for people traveling uh, from India to the United States. So I'll stop now and maybe take questions during the Q&A session at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Sahai. This was really interesting. And uh, uh, in your discussion, when you pointed out that there was dis there was a decrease in uh, Indian students in US in those two years, that was going to that uh, trend was uh, being diverted to Australia, you know, and Australia was gaining the numbers actually during the time when uh, the, it was decreasing in US. You know, the, the data says that. So thank you very much for this. Uh, so now I would uh, uh, like to invite our last speaker, uh, Dr. Erika Sarmento. Uh, she is uh, she has done her PhD in history of America, uh, and she is a professor uh, at the State University of uh, Rio de Janeiro, and a coordinator of the Immigration St Studies Lab Laboratory. Uh, she is uh, a researcher on the National Council of Scientific and Technological Development and the Research Support Foundation for the state of uh, Rio de Janeiro. I invite you, please. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, good morning. Good evening. Uh, I speak from Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be on this forum. Thank you, Camelia. Sorry for my English. In recent years, I have dedicated myself to speaking Spanish because I'm a professor of history of Latin America. Uh, at the beginning, uh, according to the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs of the U.S. Department of State, Brazil ranks 19 among the countries that send the most students to the United States. In total, there were 16,059 Brazilians enrolled in the acad academic years 2018-2019. During that period, there were roughly 1,095,000 foreign students in the USA, an increase of 0.5% of the previous years. The USA Embassy also states that the country remains the top host of international students globally. Um, it's also crucial to point out that American University profit handsomely from the tuition and fees which foreign students pay to the institutions. In fact, foreign students represents 5.5% of the enrollment in higher education institutes. Douglas Trump's decisions will have an important impact on the budgets. However, as a long pass, the students have at least one class online. 
they can still get a visa. But again, to do so, these students are required to participate in at least one in-person class. A corollary issue of these distinctions has to do with the option of practicing here, opting uh, a work permit allowed to foreign students after they con concluded their studies. It's possible that those Howard States back in Brazil taking class online will not be considered 100% active students and may be denied opt. This is a major concern for Brazil students who aim to assess the labor market in the new, new United States once they conclude their studies. Moreover, there is no meaningfulness in taking a course in American university completely online. That's because the experience of living abroad in the quintessential part of studying abroad. To be sure, we are dealing with Brazilian higher education students who even a country as large large as Brazil represents only a small number of the overall population that gets into graduation course. Even so, besides high education students, the case of business professor or postdoctoral scholar is also telling as some have scholarships from the Brazilian government and they do, they too may lose access to the United States. However, they are read decreasing progressively and that it's important to note, although current Brazilian politics do not prioritize science and scholarships cuts mainly in the humans area. In this regard, Rafael Monteport Ferreira, the president of the Brazilian Association of Students Abroad, Brasa, also highlighted in an interview given on August 7, 2020, that the Brazilian situation is the first. Brazil Institutions Fellow continue to receive assistance, regardless of whether they will attend in class or remote class. Mm -hmm. Second, students who will start the semester in September remotely can take their class. They just will not have their institutes validated by the American government. When they return to the United States, they must reval revalidate their status in order to enter the country. In the case of Brazilian, one of the challenges and countries is the temporary closures of consulate in the country due to the coronavirus pandemic. Most of the students who start their studies in the next semester have not obtained their visas and must face a delay since some consulates are still closed. The situation of the Brazilian students community, the, the, the third point, in the United States is hampered by the closing of borders. Even with the revocation of the misery that had been announced on July 16, American boards remain closer to foreigners we have been in Brazil in the last 14 days. Because of this, even students who have their face-to-face -face class cannot travel directly to the United States. In addiction, another difficult faced by Brazilian stu students is the reflection of the financial crisis linked to the pandemic. Since the Brazilian currency, the real has depreciated considerably against the dollar. Consequently, it's difficult or impossible even for middle class to travel in United States or to Europe. Recently, a group of students met to ask the Brazilian government for help in trying to negotiate an ex ex exception agreement for national students with active ties in North American institutions. Brazilian students complained that Europe, Europe's were exempt and they want Itamaraty to negotiate with the American government so that Brazilian students are also sent. They consider that in education, travel is essential and that country like Canada, for example, already sent all students from the travel restrictions. The group of Brazilian students created an Instagram com campaign to pressure the Brazilian government to take a stand. One of the posts says, 
international students from all countries must be accepted for travel restrictions. The students say, we need the support. A negotiation, a negotiation can be made. Our government all say that it has a good relationship with the government there. That's totally possible. If it were a health issue, countries like Mexico will be banned. In general, the situation for Brazilian students likes to get more complicated in relation to their return to Brazil from the United States, States as well. Maybe this situation will be extended until the vaccine arrives because probably Brazil will continue to be one of the countries with high rates of infection. Even so, it's necessary to implement return policies for students, perhaps agreement between countries so that students can start their school semester in September and can quarantine before integration to society at large. So what policy should have in Brazil or in other Latin American countries to the improvement of the students' migration during the pandemic period? One of the policies that Brazil could adopt for students' migration during the pandemic should be conducted through the Brazilian Embassy Truth Agreement with the United States regarding the commitment of these students to quarantine in the United States before starting class. Please Another... conclude. Please conclude. conclude. Okay, I conclude. Um, I conclude with important things. In the last week, the Brazilian government cut 18% of the Ministry of Education budget, budget and increased the military's budget. This means a loss of millions in Brazilian education, scholarships. This government's priority is not education. That much is clear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it was very interesting. And yes, uh, uh, you know, the uh, government to government uh, agreements can actually resolve some of the issues that the this COVID has brought and uh, solve some of the problems that the students are facing. So uh, basically, we have uh, done with all the speakers. But uh, in the end, we also have the pleasure of having Professor Vinod Khadria with us, who has worked extensively on student migration. So can I invite him for two minutes, sir? Professor Khadria, sir, are you there? Uh, uh, Professor Sadana, uh, Dr. Sadana, is Professor Khadria here? He's here, but maybe, you know, we can do one thing. We can yeah. have some questions out there. Uh, uh, actually, we that. are actually running short of time. Yes, we are yes. already, uh, but uh, yeah. you know, if someone has uh, yeah. uh, a question and uh, he or she can come directly and ask, you know, uh, we have uh, some of the issues raised in the chat box, but yeah. uh, uh, several of these issues are already addressed by the speakers, you know, so uh, I can. Uh, invite some of the uh, speakers to ask direct uh, uh, audience to ask direct questions, address th themselves. Can I mention something, Mengwa? Yes, please, but, please do, please do. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I think the discussion was fascinating, and I really learned a lot from from the different contexts. Uh, but I think one thing we were uh, missing in the discussion was the role of internationalization at home. Mm -hmm. This concept that has been developed to, to try to, as, as you mentioned it, uh, going abroad is very expensive for everybody and for developing countries. And very few have the chance, some of us, to, to uh, study abroad, move Geographic. Uh, uh, Sadaji, please unmute yourself and speak. Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead, Professor. Yeah. So, so I think this is another debate, not only about redefining what is an international student now, but 
we all in many ways are doing internationalization at home online. So I think this is a new a, a moment where we have to redefine, reshape this idea because as it was mentioned by, by Erica, uh, most of all, most of our governments are facing these budget cuts and we will be facing these um, this, uh, financial constraints uh, regarding internationalization. So we need to be more creative. We need to start rediscussing the role of this online, you know, yes. um, yeah. internationalization. Yeah. And so yes. I only wanted to say that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is Professor Kadria there? Yes, yes, he's back. Okay, right Professor Kadria, please. Can we have your views also on this important topic? Thank you. Thank you for uh, this opportunity. Yeah. But it was a fascinating session. Yeah. And I had just stepped out uh, because I was attending right from 5.30, the other one. And uh, I think most of the important points have already been made, starting with... Uh, uh, Amba yourself uh, talking about the uh, you know the kind of you know conflicts of interest that are there in terms of uh, it is becoming a, a subject of trade trade in services you know and we have seen that uh, you know under the WTO negotiations how new subjects were brought under the canvas of trade in services education health and so on. And all these things that we have discussed are actually part and parcel of that framework, whether it is uh, students going abroad for education or institutions moving. Uh, there are, of course, hurdles in terms of national legislative frameworks, which are coming in the way of where, how it should be dealt with, whether it should be part of the education ministry or it should be part of the Ministry of Commerce. So those are some of the considerations, but COVID has uh, put us in a spot. COVID has made it important to look at various aspects of education uh, in a disaggregated form, starting with uh, issues of, somebody had mentioned about admission, but there are other issues like examination or grading. I mean, in fact, the United Kingdom is going through this issue of U-turn on grades you know, whether they should be uh, awarded to some algorithm of what they had done in the classrooms earlier, or they should be assessed by their teachers. So, and this thing has been experienced by uh, India also, because in terms of terminal students, uh, how should they be assessed? Whether they um, should be, you know, their internal assessment should be good enough or uh, whether that would be discriminatory. Uh, because many of the terminal students are going to become international students. And they, some of them have already been in the pipeline in terms of their uh, overseas students fees have been partly paid, their accommodations have been booked, and you know, even travel tickets have been bought. So there is a kind of a log jam that uh, the students are in. So I would like to put it that we are in uncertain times and the level of anxiety is quite high. And that is universal. That I think is the, is the characteristic of uh, the education system, whether it is national system or international education. COVID has become omnipresent in the psyche of the people. Parents, teachers, students, administrators, all the stakeholders are actually affected by this. So I would not like to take more time because I know you are short of time, but certainly I have thoroughly enjoyed the discussion and one can build on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And thank you all from, for this very interesting session. And actually, we, we touched upon so many issues. We touched upon the this new trend of uh, online education. Then, then there, there is a question of, then comes the question of uh, exposure, the whole exposure that internationalization of uh, education brings to students, you know, uh, that is lacking. And then there is also a question of uh, how the, the, the lack of access uh, uh, to technology in several of the countries, so how they are going to uh, 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 challenge that, to face that. But uh, within these frameworks, we also have a hope that uh, 
uh, the world will come back to its original self very soon and i really hope so and that and that point at that point uh, we are we will be again faced with the question of um, how much this uh, international uh, migration of student uh, is helping the developing countries even in terms of human capital if we are talking about but in case of india we see most of them are settling uh, in uh, the destination countries only you know so the, the whole idea of human capital building in uh, in such cases is partially uh, is true only partially so then those uh, larger question comes and uh, then the whole question actually student migration is a welcome trend in uh, as far as cross pollination of ideas etc is concerned but my point is only this that why not developing countries can also be the um, uh, destinations for uh, uh, international students you know they can also be and it was interesting to uh, hear uh, ambassador shobhan mention about uh, uh, malaysia how malaysia is actually now attracting more and more bangladeshi students so that is also a trend that that we should welcome and any initiative of uh, welcoming the uh, foreign universities in developing countries to opening campuses i think is a very welcome idea because this whole idea of cross pollination of ideas and uh, exposure will then uh, go to the larger uh, populations and and that will be interesting you know and uh, that also creates a kind of uh, uh, vitality in the local education i think so so uh, that's a very welcome trend and uh, only future will tell how this is going to develop so thank you very much thank you all for being here uh, in this wonderful session and in the end i would like to invite uh, dr monica bisht uh, uh, for proposing vote of thanks thank you मोनिका प्लीजिंग give thank what of thanks and few words but i take this opportunity to give whole hearted thanks to the esteemed speakers professor maria amelia vicaria ambassador nahida shobhan dr alma maldonado professor luiso luis arnaldo ordenez vela dr anjali sahai dr erica samanto for this insightful discussion today uh respected speakers your knowledge and ideas have enlightened us in the area of uh, international student migration it was a great pleasure of listening to all of you and we have indeed learned several dimensions on of student migration such as brain drain ms the emergence of the aspiring students from middle class backgrounds in different part of the world online mode of teaching and learning mo mode mental health issues of financing for returned students in the country of origin for, from the purview of latin america and asia during the current phase of the covid-19 and the impact of covid-19 in the future trend of the student mobility thank you everyone for this exciting and informative panel discussion it is my privilege to thank dr amba pandey for moderating this panel discussion in so organized and effective manner i must appreciate it and Uh, give uh, give best wishes from the GRFT team. I also like to thank all the participants, especially Professor Vinod Khadaria, Professor C S Hyde, Dr. Raj Bhardwale, for giving your important input and for your kind participation in this webinar. Further, I apologize to the speakers if I have pronounced any of your names incorrectly. I extend my whole hearted thanks to all the researchers. young scholars students from india and abroad who have participated in our webinar today many of have participated since beginning and you are giving so much appreciation support support and uh, you know kind messages from across the world and thank you for those words last but not the least i extend my thanks to the organizers especially the support team for their uh, communication channels 
for their assistance as well as providing timely information in several social media platforms now let me inform you about our next virtual panel discussion the title of the webinar is employer side visa it will be hosted on 25th august 2020 at 5:30 pm indian standard time we request you to kindly register via the given link and join us again in our next panel discussion now i have one more impo important information to announce here i am very glad to inform you that the four organizations that is migrant forum asia cross regional center for refugees and migrants grftp and civil society action committee are organizing a six months online certificate course on global compact for migration from october 2022 march 2021 with collaboration this course is aimed at providing an interdisciplinary and comprehensive approach to understand the human progress vis-a-vis -vis migration and engage the learner in the various applied areas and act as a uh, change agent the minimum eligibility criteria for the participants is a bachelor's degree with good writing and speaking skills in english the certificate course will have 16 credits and have no fees like our other panel discussion Uh, this course will also be streamed via zoom platform we will open the registration link from 20th august till 28th august the details will be provided with all of you soon and we request to kindly circulate that poster among your colleagues students and young scholars i request you to please follow us on twitter and subscribe to our youtube channel to know updates from our site details are available www.grcc.com With this note, I close this webinar here. Good night from India. And uh, thank you, Professor Kamilia. And we'll take uh, some break actually, both CISA and JRFDT. Then we'll come back again after having some, you know, uh, reflection on how it have uh, you know gone through and what next plan is. So we'll come back again. And thank you, Professor Kamilia, for your company and all support you have given. with the, all the participants of the you know speakers from latin american side it was very enriching and we we'll look forward more collaboration with you thank you thank you thank you thank you